follow some supplemental um, information. As I said, the financial statements are 79 pages long, and that's why I think the town board uh, likes it when I just do a summary as opposed to going over page by page. As I mentioned, there are two bases of accounting uh, utilized. One's the full accrual and one's uh, the modified accrual basis of accounting. And they actually have quite different results as you would expect. Uh, in the modified accrual basis of accounting, our equity is at $35 million. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, under the full accrual method and under the modified accrual method, it's $12.6 million. So there is like a $23 million difference between the two bases of accounting. Not unusual, actually, the unusual part in this town is that the difference is so small. Many, many other towns are normally in the negative when they go to, to the full accrual. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is that these are your financial statements. They're not my financial statements. Kevin puts them together, obviously, and, and does all the disclosures. The only thing that's actually here that's mine is the uh, auditor's opinion. And lastly, it is a clean opinion or a modified opinion, which is what you're looking for, basically, we're giving you our professional opinion that these financial statements are fairly stated and in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, which obviously is what you, what you want to see. The second item is uh, these financial statements are, are the audit itself was in accordance with generally audit, uh, accepted auditing standards, which is a level much higher than a regular audit and requires us to actually test internal controls. And that's the biggest difference. We really have to plan the audit uh, as if we're gonna rely on internal controls, which here we can and uh, actually test internal controls, which in a, in a normal uh, regular audit, you don't always have. The condensed financial statement, just briefly, I've attached. Um, again, as you all know, the, the financial statements for governments are normally just one year, um, it, which doesn't really give you a lot of context for, for any trends, et cetera. So what we've done to, to is put a condensed um, financial statement just for the general funds, which in this case equal the, the two general funds in the highway fund. Uh, for, for five years, so you can see the, the, the various trends. In 2020, um, so the major changes in the balance sheet were uh, cash was up about $737,000. And that was mainly the result of our net income. Our net income was $602,000. Uh, other than that, there weren't very many changes in the balance sheet. A couple of uh, ratios we always try to look at, uh, which are important, we believe, to governments. Number one is the strength of the town, and that's usually measured by the uh, equity uh, as compared to total assets. And as you can see in our case, uh, for the past five years, that's remained fairly steady, right around 90, 91%, very strong, obviously. So 90% uh, uh, of our assets we own, 10% creditors own. Uh, so that, that is in itself uh, is a very, a good indication of, of the high strength of the town. The other thing we like to look at is, you know, the town could be criticized for having too much fund balance at times. So. Uh, although in times like this, you really have to have that cushion. So one of the things we measure is our unassigned expenditures uh, to our budget as a percentage. Uh, the national GFOA recommends that be at least 17% uh, overall for general funds. And as you can see, ours in the current year is, is 25, almost 26%. So not out of line with what, uh, obviously the minimum you would think would be 17%. And obviously in these times, uh, it's not excessive. On the income statement side, uh, a lot more changes as, as you would anticipate. I, I think the good news is that um, COVID wasn't as bad to us as it was to many others. Uh, our total revenues were down about $334,000. Um, I guess I would have expected coming into the audit that sales tax would have been much, much lower, uh, but sales tax was only down about $177,000. And as a percent, that was relatively small. You know, in, uh, like in the other city of Cohoes, I do, those were running 30, 30% or 30, 35% in April, uh, in, in May and June. So uh, you guys really weren't hit as badly with the decrease in sales tax. Obviously, because of COVID, there were a number of things down. Two of those things were departmental revenues, which were down about $275,000. And obviously, fines and forfeitures with the courts closed for much of the time were down about $125,000. Uh, on the bright side, our mortgage tax was up over $400,000. So that offset many of those, those decreases. As I said, bottom line, our, our revenues were down about $339,000. On the expense side, uh, they, they were down also, obviously, uh, but not as much. Expenses were down about $103,000. Uh, what really led the way there was culture and recreation, which is obviously the recreational programs where uh, the expenses were down about $186,000. So covered most of that. 
Um, obviously, I think if you look at the financial statements, you'll see in the MDNA, much of this in much more detail is, is in there, but I just tried to hit some of the some of the bigger numbers, but Kevin does a good job of disclosing all the things that, that occurred and uh, all the variances. As far as required communications that we have to make, um, there was there continues to be a lot of changes in government, and uh, mm -hmm. this year was no no different. GASB eighty four came along, and how we treat fiduciary activities, and there's a number of fiduciary activities the town does. Primarily the the two service award programs that we're involved in, and it changed the accounting for that. And you'll see that uh, in note nine to the financial statements, we actually increased um, the, um, the the equity of the town by a million eight to recognize some of the assets of one of the, the service award plans. Um, other change, uh, other changes, we had no uh, changes in existing accounting policies other than that, GASB 84. Uh, there were no transactions for which we had a lack of guidance. Uh, there's really no sensitive estimates in these financial statements at all. Uh, no sensitive disclosures in the financial statements with po one possibility of, um, you know, what you see now in all financial statements is, is a, a reflection of COVID, COVID being out there and obviously how it may affect uh, operations of any entity. Um, we had no adjustments to control those rep reported balances, which is obviously really a, a good thing for you guys. I mean, that's what you want to see. You want to know that the information you're getting on an interim basis throughout the year and end at your end is information you can make valid, dis uh, valid decisions on. And obviously that's the case if we're not making any adjustments at year end. Um, we had no uh, consultation, or management had no consultations with other auditors, and we really had no other findings or comments. Um, lastly, we did get the management letter signed uh, by Kevin, which is important to us because it does say that he's in agreement with, uh, with the presentation. Obviously he would be, he put it together, um, but uh, that was really our report for this year. No other findings. Well, Kenneth. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Any questions for board members? Yeah, just a quick question. It, yep. it sounds like everything, you know, on our side was pretty healthy and, and where it should be. What are what are some of the things that you're seeing with other communities that may not have as as strong of practices, things to perhaps for us to look out for in the future? You know, Tim, I guess I'm, I'm a little surprised um, that things aren't as bad as, as they could be. Uh, for the most part, the towns and cities I do, although negatively affected, it wasn't as bad as ever, as they anticipated. Okay. Um, so, you know, I really, I, I, that, that surprised me. I really expected a lot, lot worse. Um, you know, and obviously now, um, you know, the, the aid that's coming to the town, I know the aid here is the same as the, we're, my hometown city of Cahoe is a million eight. Uh, so that's interesting that it gives you other opportunities to do things, you know, so. Some may say a, an ice hockey rink would be would be a good use for that money, but uh, well, talk that, to Clifton Park. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That would build one. the lobby, but yeah. that yeah, that would get you the whole thing. Not much ice comes with one point eight. Yeah, uh, that's thank, true. Thank thanks, guys. Zamboni. <laughs> yeah. Uh, quick question, Ken. Um, yeah. Just on the um, other uh, open points. I'm looking at, it looks like a liability of say $9 million, um, you know, between the 1% decrease and the 1% increase, the baseline. Yep. Um, so what that means is let's say we uh, kept the OPEB for all current employees and all people who are retired. We didn't make any change that everybody's grandfathered in, but as of say tomorrow, you, we stopped it for any employee that came in. This would mean that uh, over the next X number of years, and that's a uh, number derived by actuaries, the town would spend $9 million until, the, until this liability just ended with the deaths of all the people who retired. That's is, true. Is that right? That's true. It, it measures that liability as of that date. You're right. You're, you are correct. Okay. Um, and I know we've made several changes over the years to, uh, because you know municipalities are worried about this liability affecting future generations and everything. And I, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the town of Malta has done a fairly good job, you know, protecting employees rights on the one hand, but safeguarding future generations on the other. So uh, am I right in that? Yes, you are. Uh, you know, unfortunately, your hands are a little tied. I mean, you are putting money aside. <coughs> Excuse me. If you were able to put money aside in the trust, we could take the interest rate you're using right now, which is 2.12% uh, of your investments and utilize a rate say similar to what you use by the retirement plan right now, which is 6.8%. Given that, 
just I think that interest rate sensitivity you were talking about, the, the interest rate sensitivity shows that for a one for one percent change, the liability changes one point three million dollars. So if we were able to use that higher rate right. for every one percent, it would reduce that liability by one point three million dollars. Okay. Now that's yeah. been proposed by uh, it's in it's been proposed legislation for a number of years, a lot of years since this became a, a, a problem. The problem is no one in the legislature thinks it's really a big deal because there's not many towns that have the money to afford to invest. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're, you're torn until that legislation actually gets, gets pushed through. Okay. Um, I, I had another thought there and I forgot what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's nothing we can do. I mean, we, no, we, we really can't not. really I mean, have Other a trust. than changing the terms, well, as you said, changing the terms of the plan, which, you know, some municipalities have said, okay, you used to be 10 years that you needed for a full vesting. Now you're going to need 15 years, right. things of that nature. But again, the problem with that is many of them are dealing with union contracts. Right. And the union, as you know, if you give something, they want something back. And many of the current needs are like health insurance, reducing or you know having more employee contribution for health insurance. And that usually takes precedent over something that's a liability down the road. You know, So that, that really hasn't been much of a... Um, there hasn't been much action in that area to okay. do those things. The only thing we could do is fully fund the liability, right? Well, you could, but there's no mechanism to do that legally in New York right now. That was what well, I was saying about the trust. Yeah, you know, we well, actually- Well, there's two parts to that though, Ken. There's, there's funding the obligation, which we're partially doing now. Right. We don't have it in a reserve fund because as you point out, there's no statutory basis, but we have uh, kind of set aside some uh, fund balance for this, purpose, we could set aside an adequate amount to cover the entire liability. That's one thing we could do, but it would be a huge number right Well, now. the problem with it, I mean, you could do that. There's no problem with that. The, the, the nicer thing with the trust is now instead of a 2% rate, yeah, you, you could, could use invest a 6% in some, rate. Right. And we can yeah. invest in things that will yield 6%. Right. We would and, need that. Authority. And as I said, Kevin had asked me the same question. I said, I, really what I think, it's kind of a no brainer. The, the state controller's office does that with retirement plan. Right. So why yeah. can't they have a branch that does this? Number one. Number two, there's legislation in New York where the, the retirement plan has to be fully funded to protect employees, but there's no legislation to protect employees for this benefit. Right. You know, so it makes no sense why the legislature hasn't really worked, you know, brought it forward. Yeah. Um, so maybe is that I'll, on the horizon at all? In the it's been on the, 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 if you go to the, what Kevin goes, he goes to the GFOA meetings every yeah. year, they talk about it and it's just stuck, you know, it's just not moving at all. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I talk to John McDonald every once in a while because he's a cohosier and I see him, but yeah. there's nothing happening on it. So, okay. Got you it. could lobby for that, Darren. You know, all I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's truly. Yeah. You know, well, no, we will. Maybe yeah. we will. All right. Because there are other communities in your position. Okay. You know, but not, not as, not enough, maybe. Okay. So, any other questions for Ken? Thank I you. wish you would find Kevin doing something wrong. It's so boring every year. It's the same you know, thing. There's nobody wants to find Kevin do something wrong more than I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how you, if, if how many years have been trying? How many mm -hmm. decades? If there's one well, place yeah. I want boring, it's in a control. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, John, part of the problem there is I'm the one who taught him, you know, in accounting. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ken. My really pleasure, appreciate guys. it. And, and nice job, Kevin. Thank you very much. Good work, Thank Kevin. You, Kevin. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next presentation tonight is um, uh, the LA group, and this is a proposed um, tweak to the form-based code. Hi, good evening. Uh, Matt Brofson with the LA group. I'm joined tonight uh, with Lisa Mitson, who's a proponent for the, for the project that we're proposing on Route 9. Uh, as soon as Jamie loads it up, I'll do a quick run through. Shouldn't take too much of your time. Um, we, we, we came and met with um, planning staff about the project um, that's being proposed, and um, they suggested um, a couple options. Um, one, having to, having to deal with the, the, the current use that's not allowed in, in the zone um, and, and how, how we should approach that. One of the options was to um, come to the town board and, and request that, uh, an amendment to the zoning to include this zone within the form-based code for the GC3 district. Um, and the other was going through um, a use variance um, application with the zoning board. Um, in my experience and um, staff's experience, um, those are less likely to be um, successful. Um, and um, appearing in front of in, in appearing, appearing in front of the town board 
um, and, and, and asking for this uh, use amendment, it, it was, it was, it was um, a much more easy approach or clean approach, I should say. Sure. So that's how we um, moved forward. So what I'd like to present to you is um, just a little bit of where the, the site we're looking at. Uh, this will, a lot, a lot of this would come again um, as part of the site plan application. So it's, it's a preliminary sketch plan. You guys did receive that as well, as well as a, a quick narrative. Um, Lisa's gonna talk a little bit about that project and what she's looking to do uh, with the business end of it. And I'm just gonna kind of walk through the uses um, that we're talking about and um, the, the location of, of where it is and why we think it's a good fit for this location um, moving forward. So really looking at the, the vacant parcel of land that you see in the middle here. Um, it's been um, subdivided multiple times, gone through PUD um, requests, um, had, had been requested for different uses in front of the town planning board, um, had been um, the subject of many lawsuits here and there. Um, so really trying to get this property um, developed for the town. Um, and this, this, is the, this is the parcel we're trying to move forward. We, we think it's a, a good fit for this use. The current uh, zoning, the GC3, really encourages a green corridor through that area. So really wider areas of green space in the front to kind of keep that green area. Um, we feel that this use really lends itself to that. We're going to be able to keep that green corridor in the front along Route 9, as well as provide adequate buffers and minimize our disturbance to the existing um, tree and forested areas along the rear of the property, which I think is the major issues that some of the neighbors had and some of their concerns um, um, looking back at some of the previous developments. This is an interesting zone in that some of the different um, building types and things like that don't really apply here. They have some special zoning requirements and, and restrictions, and it really lends, we think, to the type of building we're trying to do. We're really trying to do a, a smaller scale building, really um, fitting into the it, into the environment so that you don't see it so much, and it kind of um, creates this um, this presence of you know for the, for this use. These are, the, these are the current uses and a lot of the uses do, are applicable here. There's an animal hospital on, on here, which we have a, a possible veterinary part of our, of our, of our building. Um, pet grooming and those types of things are allowed. The one thing that's not allowed um, in, this, in the zone, the main thing is, is the pet boarding and the overnight boarding of, of, of animals in this zone. This same use, the same company, the same um, business is really being moved, and Lisa can talk to this more um, from a from a place a little further north on Route Nine to this location now, and um, that's a main component. And she can talk about how that's going to be regulated and kind of alleviate some of the concerns that some of the neighbors might have um, with pet boarding and and how that might affect their their environment and, and uh, their neighborhoods. Um, the other item that um, we've talked about and is important for this use is an on-site um, employee dwelling unit, which is a unit for someone like a caretaker to stay on-site and on the premises during these um, hours of boarding and really um, be attentive to the, to the pets that are on-site. And it's really part of their duties. It's part of their duties as the employee that takes that on. And um, they, they are, that unit is really for their use to stay in that unit and maintain and tend to the animals, usually during those overnight hours. Mm -hmm. So that's their main use. And it's something that a pet owner, I'm not a pet owner that needs to board animals, but it is something I'm told that is- uh, If you'd like really to borrow our dog for a month or six, yeah. you, you, need you might be it. available. <laughs> yeah, you don't want someone that's not not there. <laughs> and, that, and, and that's a big thing. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa. She's gonna kind of walk through some of the, um, some of the particulars of the site or the, the business. This is the site plan that you guys have in your application. Again, this is very preliminary and she can kind of touch on some of the different uses in here. And as she's talking, I'll kind of flip through some of the different images and um, inspirational images that she kind of is, is pulling from for, for this business. Hi everyone, good evening. I don't know if Hello. I'm through the microphone. Sure, okay. Um, thank you for uh, seeing us tonight and having us at the meeting. So as Matt mentioned, um, my vision and what I'd like to do is I have recently acquired Mahogany Ridge, which is the doggy daycare and boarding and training facility currently located right on Route 9 in Malta. And my 
hope is to rebrand that and be able to move that but stay in Malta, right on Route 9. So this really is the perfect location for our project. And what we really would like to do is be able to expand the business and allow for um, doggy daycare and overnight boarding only for our daycare clients. And the reason that I bring that up is that we're not looking for the out of town tourists to come driving up Route 9 and drop their dogs off to us. That's not at all what the plan is. Um, Jennifer Weiss is with me tonight who has actually owned uh, Mahogany Ridge for 10 years, and she is staying on as the general manager. Thank God, because I really don't know much about dogs. She's helping to train me. Um, but the one of the things that she's taught me and that I love about Mahogany Ridge and I plan to keep is that the dogs that are there for daycare are comfortable there. It becomes like their second home. So staying there overnight is comfortable. They don't have anxiety. They're, they're familiar in the area that they're in. So there's less barking. The dogs know each other. So there's less you know, opportunity for any type of noise and things like that. So... Um, She's also an amazing dog trainer. So we'd like to offer some obe obedience and you know agility training. Um, we'd also like to work with some of the current shelters and offer uh, some board and trains to essentially provide some enrichment training programs that would help some of these dogs that are in shelters now not able to find a home, maybe to be able to become uh, matched up and, and fit nicely into a home. Uh, we'd also like to offer some programs too, where if someone is in a situation where they have to go in for a rehabilitation or a medical procedure, and they don't have the means to, to board their dog, and they would or cat and unfortunately have to give their animal up, we'd like to be able to offer, um, you know, to help with those programs uh, at no cost. So going along with all of this is we will have dog grooming. Um, and eventually a veterinary clinic, a small animal clinic uh, on the property. And I think that the important thing too is having that caretaker slash security person to work to work and live on the property. I think that that's key for comfort for everyone involved, whether it's your pet you're leaving there for, uh, what was it, 30 to 30 days to six months. What was that number? <laughs> Could be we, higher if you want to bid up. There well. you go. We need someone on property just for the safety and security. And trust me when I tell you, I don't want to be a landlord. Um, I would not charge rent for that unit. It would be made a part of the employee's compensation and benefit package um, be, as it would be part of their role and their duties to do some, you know, late night let outs, which is about 1030. I think that's all in my long winded narrative that I passed out. So I won't bore you with all those details. Um, and so I, I think that's pretty much it. Did I cover it all, Matt? I think so. So I guess I would just open it up to any questions at this point that you might have. I, I just had two, sorry, two questions. Sure. One, um, it, it, you say that it, as a business, but you're also saying you're donating the, the profits to the Humane Society. Is this envisioned as a business, as a nonprofit? What is the structure that you guys are looking at? This would be a for-profit business uh, run just like any other business. However, um, what we would like to do, my husband and I, is any profits that are um, earned here, we would like to donate to local animal charities. Uh, the Humane Society is an example of that, but we would great. hope to be able to help many animals in need in the community. That's great to hear. The, the other question that I had is just as I look at the site plan, the, the back end of this looks like it's it gets relatively close to, to Kramer Woods and to Little. And I know it looks like that's just play areas. I, my only concern is about the barking, how close we're going to get to the neighborhoods there. Can you talk a little bit about that and what, what, if there's a plan for that or, or yes. if we shouldn't be concerned? Well, I mean, like kids, dogs make noise. So I can't guarantee a hundred percent that no one will hear a dog bark. However, I know that Jen runs a great operation and our ratio of having one employee to every 10 dogs really helps to minimize and control the behavior such as barking or, or any kind of chaos. So there would be an individual, you know, assigned to each yard with the dogs. The dogs are not out there unattended. Okay. 
So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yes. Sure. And the nighttime, um, there wouldn't be dogs outside. They would all be boarded indoors, right? It's indoor kenneled only, correct. Yes, they're let out at night for their last time, if you will, around uh, 10 or 10.30. And then they'd be back up and out in the morning around 7 or 7.30, roughly. And on the weekends, I would just add, there's, there's no doggy daycare hours on the weekends. It's only the dogs that are there boarded over the weekend that are brought in and out, you know, during the daytime on the weekends. How many dogs do you anticipate being able to board at a time? To board, yeah. it'd be about 25. Okay. So I guess just to be clear, our, the, the amendments that we need to make are to um, allow overnight boarding mm -hmm. and and the, the dwelling unit, is that something the that employee. we would have to? Right. And, and we're, we can define that specifically so that we don't change the code to allow any other residential stuff. And you, you guys think that this definition is, is adequate, the employee accessory, accessory dwelling unit? And Lisa, is, is your, head, is your uh, husband Ed? Yes. Are we going to get some horse training facilities next and uh, <laughs> well, relocate a, a great marketing firm down here? Well, you never know. <laughs> I, I think in looking at the, at the, you know, your proposal here, the, you know, the sketch, you know, you do have your fenced in areas are really quite a ways away from, yeah. from, from the little drive development and Kramer Woods, you know, back there is a training trails. And so I think the way you, you know, kept the buffering in place. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't, I don't, I personally don't see it as a heavy lift. So. Thank you. We also plan to do a uh, double fencing. So there'll be a privacy fence and then each of the dog yards would be fenced additionally inside of the privacy fence, which is for safety, but also adds even more of a buffer. Mm -hmm. for Jamie, if we add these two uses to this, um, are you foreseeing what kind of consequences with other properties in the town? Do you foresee, if any? Yeah. Can I understand where the GC3 zones are? Do we have a, a map we can throw up? Of the form-based code right. to the north and to the south. And the so the amendment would be to allow overnight boarding of dogs in those zoning districts. Correct. And okay. the employee accessory well Okay. Um, vet veterinarian, veterinary operations are allowed as it is, or animal hospitals with, uh, is there a special use permit required or? Because they're in form based code. It, no? no, there's not. So, veterinary clinics are an as of right use. Is dog, I'll call it doggy daycare, is doggy daycare an as of right use in the GC? Yes. Okay. And so, the only change is to allow overnight boarding of animals. Mm -hmm. And you can board an animal overnight at a veterinary clinic, right? It happens all the time. Really, the um, if, practically, there's not much of a, a difference here, except the, the animals staying overnight for um, other than medical reasons. What, um, I mean, what kind, of, is, is this um, envisioned to be a situation where if I'm on vacation, my animal is going to stay with you for a week or two? Is that kind of the model? Yes, currently um, Mahogany Ridge offers boarding, uh, overnight boarding, and um, it is when people travel for vacation or, you know, whatever is needed. How, how, how much does your business model depend upon full development of the site as you've shown? Is there any way to pull back from the residential areas to provide a greater buffer and alleviate some of that concern? 
Well, I, I mean, I think we, we drew it to show you the absolute max that it would be. I, I mean, I feel that with uh, the back area and with it being 16 acres, I think there'll be a, a very sufficient buffer um, between us and the neighbors. Okay, In the because... back area, if you notice on the drawing, there's, there are some trails. Those would not be open to the public, like for, for people to just come and walk their dogs. There Those would are. only be used by dog trainers working one-on-one -on -one to improve dogs on leash, things right. like that. The trick, of course, is that um, we're here in charge of, um, you know, the farm-based code. We don't do um, site plan approval. Sure. So, or, or you know, so we don't, or, or in this case, uh, the planning, you know, staff do uh, approval. So we don't control, um, you know, that uh, that parameter. Um, you know, and frankly, um, some mechanism to provide, you know, assurance that that buffer would be there would increase the chance I would support it. I'm not sure what that mechanism is but th those are my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other town board members? I no, mean, there's no real questions, Darren, but I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much uh, oh. for this presentation. I think that's a, a fantastic use for that property right there. In terms of Mahogany Ridge, they've been great neighbors since I've lived in Malta 35 years. And uh, I've never heard so much as a dog bark. That's the truth. And I'm not that far away, uh, whether it's from my house or nearby Delucia's market, never hear a bark ever. So I, I think this is a, an awesome use of this parcel here. Thank and you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you. All righty. Yeah, I agree. It's a very appealing um, proposal. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Nice job. Thank you very Thanks, much. Sir. All right, do we have any um, comments, announcements um, by town board members? Very, very briefly, uh, just wanted to uh, send out a reminder to everyone, this is the last week for the Malta Works 2021 promotion. So go out and spend $20 and 21 cents at any local uh, small business in, in Malta and you can be entered to win uh, gift cards. So this promotion to date has been associated with, with sales north of $28,000. Um, so certainly having a nice impact on our, on our local businesses. Um, but please, uh, if you can get out there and spend, you know, all you have to do is take a picture of your receipt and email it to info at saratoga.org and be entered to win uh, a gift card from one of our great Malta small businesses. All righty. Thank you, Tim. Anybody else? Um, just one quick thing. Uh, Malta Sunrise Rotary is a, uh, actually hosting um, our Congressman, Paul Tonko. Um, he's gonna be there virtually. We, we do a, um, a both either in-person or virtual uh, meeting that's sort of hybrid like we are here. If anybody, we meet at 7.15 on Thursdays, it's the 7.15 a.m. that is. Um, we're hoping to be back at the diner, but I see they haven't opened yet. So right now we're in, meeting in Panera but if you would like to join or like to be part of the Zoom um, meeting, you can email me and I'll get you a Zoom link. We've submitted questions that we hope that the Congressman will address. Um, they're all things that we believe are, are relevant to, to the town of Malta. So if you're interested in hearing what Tonko has to say, just reach out to me and I'll make sure you get a link. And that goes for all my colleagues too. Everybody, we, we would actually like, you know, the town board members to, to hopefully attend. That's this Thursday? No. Oh, I didn't say the date today. It's May 6th. May 6th. <laughs> Not this Thursday. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, anyone else? Yeah, Darren, over the uh, weekend, uh, both of our volunteer fire companies in town, Round Lake and uh, Alta Ridge, hosted their uh, an open house, kind of like a membership drive, if you will. And uh, most of the, uh, the events, so to speak, occurred at Round Lake's station. I had a pleasure to attend there. Uh, myself, John Hartzell were there. Our town justice, Woody Sloat was there, but just want to give a shout out and thank uh, our volunteers for what they do. And they did a great job. Uh, the Explore Post was really, uh, really interesting to talk with the folks there that, that had that up in town. And it's a great thing. And it's, it's really going to mean a lot for our volunteer service in the future. So I'd just like to thank them again. You right. left me out of that, Mark. I was there too. Oh, Cynthia <laughs> was there too. 
Sorry about that, Cynthia. All right, terrific. Anyone else? Okay, department heads. Um, any comments or anything from department heads? I know we have them on Zoom and here. Okay, questions or comments from town residents? And you'll have another opportunity during this meeting to speak later on, but if anybody would like to address the board now on any topic whatsoever, please do. Kathy. Hi, good to see everybody. Um, so I have to ask, is the ripe tomato on the Malta 2021? Sure is. Well, good, then we'll have 94 separate tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Because we have 94 seniors that will be eating ripe tomato on Friday. They got to send um, their seed in, though. That's the tr tricky will, part. 94 times. Except, uh, except <laughs> it's, it's, you know, the, the seniors are only paying 10 bucks. So, yeah, but we are paying more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's yeah, great. We, we didn't ask them for a discount. Uh, uh, we were very much in support of our local yeah. businesses, not as seniors only, but as Murray uh, and I. So, we are having 94 people do a drive through on Friday, which is great. And then on Monday, we will have a meeting with um, talking about senior scams with Deborah mm -hmm. Verney. So it should be quite interesting. We're getting good participation and we're starting to look at trips. So we'll let you know how that goes, but our seniors have been vaccinated. Thank you so much to the town and to uh, New York State for providing these vaccines. And hopefully we will be able to get out on the road again. So that's about it. Thank you. Kathy, can you uh, relay that information about um, the congressman and Rotary to, to your membership too? We did ask a couple of questions that are directly related to, to seniors. So sure, we'll maybe do. something there of interest. Will do. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks very much, Kathy. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, no one with their hands up right now. So we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. And that's the only action item we have on for tonight. And that's to uh, um, uh, establish the um, salary rate for our new deputy town clerk. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, the next uh, general item is to discuss the items on for action uh, a week from tonight. Um, the first item on will be the uh, amendments to the town code in terms of uh, changes that we can make during emergencies like this to make it a little bit easier for our businesses. Um, and we just had the public hearing on that tonight. And so that will be up for um, action by the town board a week from tonight. Um, and as I go through these, if any, anybody on the board wants to discuss any aspect of it, please, please jump right in. Um, Okay, the next item is the, uh, am the proposed ambulance district. Um, and this item on the, uh, on the agenda next week would be to file the map plan and report um, and specify a date, uh, which could be uh, May 24th for the public hearing on the map plan and report. Are we all in agreement then that on our own motion, this will be put to a referendum? Is that procedure? Uh, clear and agreed to, or is that subject to further discussion? Um, it can be uh, certainly subject to further discussion. Um, I, I think it's the best way to go. I, you know, I'd like to hear other members I, of the board on that issue. I agree. I agree. Okay. I agree with that too. Thank you. Yep. And, I, you know, I think the idea is also to put it on for, um, you know, a referendum at the general election in November rather than you know, go according to 12A with the property owners. And, and that's, you know, we've we've looked into the legalities of that in, in some detail. And we, we think this is the proper way under the constitution and, and the right way also. Um, okay, the next item is um, uh, a tweak to the uh, high point uh, streets and sidewalks amendment. And that would be to um, basically postpone the effective date of the uh, town code change that the board made last time. And that's to uh, give us as a town a chance to make repairs on some of those walkways before um, any kind of burden of maintenance falls on the uh, HOA and the residents. So I think we have you know, proposed language um, for the board to consider and what we would do uh, next week if the board chooses is to set a date for the public hearing. Unfortunately, we're not seeing any kind of simpler way we could do this, you know, kind of explored an idea of just doing it by resolution, but we really can't. So we have to make 
you know, another amendment. So we have to have a public hearing on that amendment before we can we can do it. And uh, we figure we'd set it for the next agenda meeting and then adopt it uh, if the board chooses to uh, at the next action meeting. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the land conveyance of the property on Dunning to the New York State Police um, so that we can uh, keep the state police in Malta uh, and, and have a barracks uh, constructed there. Um, we've been in communication with the uh, council's office at the state police. Um, and one of the things that uh, Steve and I discussed with council's office was the possibility of you know, some kind of reverter clause in the deed um, so that in case it wasn't used as a police station or something of that nature that it would return to the uh, town unfortunately through no fault of the state police um, they are just not at liberty to do that because of the attorney general's insistence that uh, they cannot enter into a contract with that um, provision um, so uh, you know my recommendation is to go through with this deal um, uh, the state police don't want this for anything other than to have a station there you know for the long term and I think it's uh, very important for Malta to maintain the state police in Malta, especially since we don't have, uh, you know, a sheriff's a sheriff's department um, uh, installation here at the at the moment. Um, so I think it'd be a uh, a very good idea. I think it's very well located for the town, right in the center, um, and close to everything. I agree, Darren. You know, with the goal, I'm a little bit concerned that if there's you know unconstrained ownership. By the state of new york that they might wind up doing things there that we or those that are sitting in the future might be concerned with i mean is there a is there a 99 year lease arrangement that might be an option in lieu of a you know complete unencumbered fee conveyance yeah we kind of discussed that steve right i mean my sense is that um we didn't have that option in front of us is that was was that your impression We can't hear Steve. What's that? Can't hear you. Sorry. We did not specifically request One of them, uh, right from them whether or not. I don't have it, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, we did not specifically request uh, uh, information about a 99 year lease, but we did request about other alternatives um, to accomplish the similar like options or refusals, all of which the council for the state police said they couldn't do. We could follow up with a further uh, question whether they'd consider a long term lease, um, but uh, as it was contemplated as a purchase and sale, I, I just didn't think. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to. If we can ask them that question between now and our meeting, you, you know, I, um, yeah, I, I think I, I can, Oh, we can definitely ask yeah. my, my willingness to, you know, perhaps I'm growing too skeptical too fast, but to, you know, grant to just give land to the state of New York without any, you know, constraints on it. Um, they can be sometimes, uh, difficult to deal with. And uh, so if there is another path forward. Certainly I'll follow up on that okay. one. Question okay, thank you. See if there's another alternative, but my sense of it is that um, at least from the state police's position on guidance from the attorney general that, that they want un, unrestricted, they want, and they're not gonna enter into an agreement otherwise. Um, but right, well, I'll look into ho it. hopefully they'll, build such a great building there that they won't, you know, quickly walk away with it. But I, you know, I, I would just note in passing here, as we all know that recently there's been some criminal activity in our town that's gotten, um, you know, notoriety that's of great concern. And, you know, Steve is a, um, recently, uh, uh, you know, a town justice, you certainly have seen the extent of the 
the criminal activity and it's growing and the severity of some of the cr the crimes is uh, is is worrisome so you know uh, the importance of having state police stay here can't be overstated i just wonder over time whether it's going to be adequate uh, for our town thanks thank you okay we'll definitely put that um inquiry into the state police this week and hopefully we'll have it we shouldn't have a problem getting an answer to that by monday okay any other discussion on this quick question darren you know you you have experience there in general what what do they consider to be sort of useful life for a barracks for the state police oh yeah. it's uh, it's Is it very decades okay. you know so it can last a long time uh, you know oh i don't know 30 40 but then they'll reconstruct add right. you know, so a lot of them have been there for a long time on the same place maybe a different kind of footprint different building second floor you know these kind of things right. but you know lots of their installations have been very very long term i mean they've okay. been around since 1917 so you know they don't have too many 99 year leases that are expiring <laughs> but um but still it's it's a long term thing i don't know if there was maybe a general cycle like a 20 year strategic plan that they operated on that that might be worth aligning to but um i trust you guys to try to ferret that out in these discussions thanks all righty um Next item on the agenda for next week action will be uh, the traffic mitigation and renewal uh, uh, agreement with CDTA, um, which is kind of routine every year. Uh, I don't think there are any unusual aspects to it this year. Um, the next one is a consent for the uh, roundabout runners club for the race on September 11th. Um, and that is you know, kind of a formality because it's it's over on uh, county roads, um, uh, but the provisions require a consent by the town, and so the proposed a proposed resolution next week will provide that consent for that race. And interestingly, that will actually be an in person. Uh, last year it was virtual, so it will be in person. So, John, get your running shoes ready. I know you're. I think the only one of us that normally runs that. So I won't. I won't have a stroller this year, so ah. I won't have an, a, bil a built-in excuse for my, uh, you know, subpar performance like uh -oh. I've had in the past. I, I've been in it several times myself. Did you, so have you run it? I have. Really? Well, run might be <laughs> extreme, but I've participated. An aggressive walk. <laughs> All right. That sounds like fun. Um Okay, uh, the uh, service award program um, for the uh, EMS department, I, I think this is kind of standard also. Kevin there, I don't think there's anything unusual with the um, item that'll be up for the board next week. No, the only unusual item is the Right. Okay, and the next will be um, the controller's audit for um, Justice Sloat, Justice Gottman. And I'm pleased to announce um, that it will be come as no surprise to anybody that the audit was um, fine. Um, there are no problems over there. Um, the next one is the Highway 284 agreement. We'll have to have a slight amendment there because we have some additional funds that we're going to be able to use for paving. Um, and so uh, I think uh, Roger will be getting that to us this week, I think, right, Kevin? Yeah. All right. That's good news. Um, next item on the agenda is the uh, two positions open for the ZBA. And um, I'm going to ask if the board would like to have an executive session after the meeting tonight to discuss um, personal matters, including this and a couple of other things. But uh, if there's anything the board you know, would want to discuss about the process now in open session, um, that would be fine. Um, otherwise, we can discuss particulars during the executive session. Is the anticipation that we would be interviewing as a board these member, these potential, these applicants? Well, that's up to the board. I mean, how would the board you know, like to proceed on this? Yeah, we've done it in the past, you know, when we've had multiple candidates. I, I certainly don't object to you know, interviewing folks. Okay. Would, would... Me too. I, and I think, you know, from my standpoint, the, there are all people that I'm really not familiar with. 
but uh, a lot of them have a lot of different qualifications and so i think it would be good okay so what we'll do is we'll we'll put this to um, all five of them and we'll ask them if they're at, if they can come in for an interview and maybe we can have the interviews um before uh, you know one i don't know if we'll be able to do it on a week from tonight uh, you know that might be a little bit short notice for some of them um, but if not, maybe we can do it the following meeting right before the meeting so that we don't have to have another, um, you know, yeah. another parent. Should we invite the chairman of the planning board? Would that be uh, zoning board? Zoning board. Oh, zoning board. I, I object to that. It's not, that's completely our prerogative as elected officials to make that choice. Okay. So we'll, we'll put, um, we'll contact the, um, uh, the potential candidates and ask them if they can come in to, to meet the board and, you know, have a chat. Okay. Um, next item is the, uh, um, a proposal to uh, amend the definition of streets uh, in chapter 167. And that's uh, due to a problem that's arisen with respect to um, paper roads and the setback um, restrictions that we have in our code uh, for auxiliary structures um, uh, and, and being applicable, you know, a setback restriction is different from a road, obviously, as it is from a next door neighbor. And, you know, the argument was that um, there's a problem with the setbacks from these paper streets, which are never used as paper streets. And, and should be the same as for a neighbor since they're never used. So, so this is a proposal and you know, I open it up for discussion by the board. Can, can I, uh, since I need grants, this perhaps have the floor for a moment? Sure. We were contacted, I think about roughly two months ago uh, for the first time was when I heard about this issue. And as I understand the history, um, a uh, landowner on Silver Beach Road uh, sought to construct something in their uh, side yard and uh, ran into uh, a zoning issue. And uh, the enforcement officer made a determination or an interpretation that the paper street, in this case, Oak, I believe it's Oak Road, mm -hmm. um, would be considered a street for purposes of determining that there's a corner lot and therefore increasing the setback requirement and precluding the construction uh, in that uh, larger setback area. Have I got that straight? The individual appealed the determination of the enforcement officer to the ZBA and was denied at that meeting. Uh, our land use council told the uh, property owner that could apply for a variance or that the town board could fix the matter. Um, I sought to find out what the fix was. Uh, and uh, I was somewhat thwarted in that effort and therefore uh, pulled this together, sent it to uh, Jamie and Steve to look at. Uh, I have no pride of authorship. There's a better, um, a more effective solution than what I proposed here. I would be fully supportive of it. As you can see, what you have is a flat map that was filed in 1927, showing a paper street in the last 94, uh, like five years or so, the street hasn't been open. It's a practical matter, you know, never will be. So uh, this is a, an effort to uh, have the town board fix as uh, our land use to hear John. suggested uh, the problem that was presented. Again, if there's some alternative fix that um, alleviates other concerns, I'll happily support it. That's the background on the proposal. Okay, anybody else on the town board want uh, to address? Yeah, I have a couple of a couple of concerns and, and questions. I mean, one thing is when I'm looking at your the the over the aerial view of of this neighborhood, um, it appears there are more than just one paper street that has not been developed. So I'm I'm worried that we're opening up a whole can of worms that there may be a lot of other properties that that would be affected by this. And so I guess my question for uh, 
the planning staff is, do we have any ballpark idea of how many properties may be affected by this action? Mm -hmm. that are on undeveloped streets. Yeah. So you're not counting. Right. Right. Um, these, the paper streets technically are owned by the HOA. Is that true? In that case, yeah. It's and this, so what, I mean, did, have we gotten any opinion? Have we talked to them? Have we, you know, talked to any other the affected properties? Um, I mean, those are the kinds of things that I think we need to at least address. The other concern that I have is, um, particularly in our, the camp plan that hopefully we'll actually have done sometime, um, we try to address the lake area and um, it's, it's an environmentally sensitive area. Um, frankly, we'd like to see less development down there rather than more. And I think that this action just encourages us to, you know, make, make the building envelope bigger and, and, and a lot of different properties. And I, that concerns me. I'm not really ready to move forward with this without a little more discussion and, you know. Jamie, was this something that was covered during the, the comp plan work? I mean, the committee spent a year plus working on and, and actually had some special attention paid to the lakefront. Is this something that was brought up and discussed? And paper streets specifically were not, but the size of lots down there with respect to the zoning and the setbacks that are required for the R4 and R6 zoning, you know, we did talk about that. But, you know, I mean, property owners have a right when they're uh, agreed by to approach the Zoning Board of Appeals. And as you know, and Cynthia knows, she's been on the board, you know, it happens quite often that the lot of our neighbors' biggest business is the lake area. Yeah. So we definitely have the zoning situation as a whole, in our opinion, but we also have the environmental situation as well. Right. Floodplains and the wetlands and, you know, drainage and building large structures on these closer sized lots that were really cottages were camps and now people are ripping them down, changing them to single family homes for year round use, which well within their right, but due to the pandemic, I mean, it was happening prior to. Yeah. But now it's really on high drive and it's very rare that anyone can rebuild what they have on the same footprint to either not get a variance or want to. Right. A lot of want to get it. Sure. I mean, isn't that a, an argument to decrease the density? I mean, it's this is arbitrary. If you happen to be next to a paper street that was laid out in 1927, you're subjected to decreased density requirements or decreased property rights. Um, you know, if you're talking about generally addressing building and development in this area, you know, to do that instead of using this backhanded means of preventing people from using property just because they arbitrarily happen to buy on a paper street that hasn't been open since 1927. Well, that, this to me isn't how you zone density by allowing 1927 paper streets to drift away. I, I think it's a challenge to say anyone's arbitrarily purchasing a home, but- um, I, no, we're, I, we're yeah. We're, we're creating a zoning requirement arbitrarily based on where their parcel is. It's located on a paper street that has never been opened and never will be. How many paper streets have they actually opened up um, in the last 25 years or so? Mm -hmm. way as well. And the front part towards the lake may be open and used. It may be clear, it may be gravel and tent. But then the back part of that same road that stains the same mm -hmm. has not been. So right, I think right. that could potentially cause distinguishing between that which is also an issue. I, 
I, and I, I, it's my understanding that the HOA did not want to consider selling that property. Is that true? That's my understanding as well. Therefore, because of that, um, the, the, that owner had his rights substantially restricted because of the different setbacks on a corner lot, true? It's hard to say. I mean, he's got structures that are within the 12 foot setback that are pre existing on his corner gates. This corner lot definition that's included down there came to be in 2005. Like, I think it was December 2005. So, anything prior to, you know, the corner lots down there, the lake road, the paper street, the private road, or everything, whatever wasn't really viewed in the same way until then. And that was part of his 2005. Was the neighbor on the other side of the other side, yeah. Because that wasn't in place at the time. I got you. I mean, that's 2005. That this has come to be. I mean, corner lots are defined this way across the whole entire town. Right. Anywhere in the town of Malta, you have property on the corner lot, you've got two front yards. And you're subject to whatever the setback is, the front yard. How many subdivisions have this many paper streets that have been mm -hmm. open since 1927? So the answer is not. Right? It's just this checkerboard of paper streets that will never be open. Well, you, using it as a zoning technique to decrease density, I don't think. It, it, it's not just that neighbor. It's the it's the whole lake the entire lakefront neighborhood. neighborhood, right? So no, it's this it's this neighborhood. Well, the the other the numbered streets have the same sort of situation down there. What's that neighborhood called? I mean, I would probably even Riley Cove. I don't know if there's a difference. The paper streets aren't open to this extent. Not yeah. even Do we have other paper streets outside of the lake? I mean, I I know we have a we have a a street that's uh, you know runs parallel to the north way and back uh, of there. Is that a paper street? Okay, how about the, the uh, how about the the road that you know might be uh, connect Dunning to nine and not have to go through the roundabout? Is that a paper street or is that the same kind of issue? And then the and the road in back of the uh, um, you know in back of well or, or, you know over there on the on the east side of nine, I think there was an idea for a road back there to relieve some of the traffic on nine, the same kind of situation. That would not be a paper road either. So we're not think we're not, we're not right now thinking of any paper, paper streets other than several of them down near the lake. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. So, I mean, those are things we want to consider. So we, we start planning to plan for the future. And those, those stubs may not be um, built out during the initial subdivision phase, but that easement or right away may have been given to the town to, for future. We need to consider those, those pieces in other areas of town as well. So how would this problem create other problems in other areas? I mean, it, it, it doesn't change the footprint of the existing property that is on the corner at all. It's a setback issue. This only applies in two zoning districts. And can I follow up on that point, John? Because um, Jamie and I had, um, had some other correspondence about this. And um, one of the things that I um, suggested that perhaps the board consider and, and to John's point of possible alternatives 
is uh, the way this was uh, just drafted was to consider only the R4 and R6. So those concerns about other areas and rezoning um, wouldn't be applicable if we um, just limited it, the board limited it to say, hey, there's a unique problem in R4 and R6 where these lots are postage stamp sizes. Right. Um, that's unique to the town. And by addressing this, the town board is saying there's a real injustice in those neighborhoods where we've had ad hoc development where one neighbor has one setback and the other neighbor has another setback for no other reason than the fact that they're on a paper street. And I thought that perhaps the way that you could do it in a more limited manner would be to define corner lot um in the r4 and r6 district only to state what the board wanted it to say when whatever that is you have the ability to do that and i'm it, totally fine with that right, Steve. And, i'm not sure there's support on the board for doing that but that's right and i'm just proposing the alternative um to address that way we're not getting into the issue of paper streets we're getting into the narrow issue of corner lot and one of the concerns was well what other paper streets are in the town if yeah. we define it as corner lots within the R4 and R6, we don't create that large nest of issues. The second point with planning was they don't want to be in a situation where they have to make a determination of usage of a paper street because um, opening a paper street and dedicating a street are, are different things. People could use it for other purposes. They could use it to access by uh, motorbike, by bicycle, by sled, by snowmobile. They've used those streets we don't want to change any definition with respect to whether it's a street or whether it's not. That's a legal mm -hmm. determination that many times um, courts are all over the place, whether it is actually a paper street because the original deeds didn't properly reference the conveyance. So there's a lot of legal issues that pay with paper streets that I don't think the board needs to get into to address the particular concern of um, what's potential injustice within you know, multiple streets, how one person has a different setback than the other. So from a planning standpoint, I think planning would say, you know, we want to have consistency and perhaps redefining the corner a lot to would be a way to do that. That That's just what I wanted to contribute to the board to consider. Yeah, I, that would, to that as an alternative at all. I, I think consistency is an important thing, but, but I also, I, I think we've, you know, we've got a vehicle right now in front of us with the, the comp plan that we, you know, I know I was adamant a year and a half, two years ago when we started working on the comprehensive plan that I wanted to see particular attention paid to the, the Lake District because of the fact that what exactly what Jamie referenced as I sat on the Zoning Board of Appeals month after month after month, we had an application come in to say, I want a, a variance to tear down an 800 square foot cottage and build a 1200 square foot in its place. And, and every month I was the lone no vote on that as, as the Zoning Board approved it to have more and more overbuilt structures on the, on, on the lakefront, which is a, a real problem across the board. Um, I, I'd like to see something like this done in a more comprehensive manner. And I think the comprehensive plan is a, the right place to do it. We don't, I don't know what's in the comp plan yet. We haven't, we haven't gotten it back and we don't, we don't know what that is. So I would, I would request that perhaps we wait to see what we have from regarding this neighborhood within the comp plan. Maybe this is something that can get baked into that, the final uh, uh, plan there uh, in some way, shape or form. We can solve this problem with, in a consistent manner. But I, I, I think that, you know, we, we have a big, problem with overbuilding on on the, the lakefront and and i'm concerned that we're not doing anything to help that help fix that uh, tim if i, I must have said something wrong because steve's no, no, popped no, back no, up not at all i'm not, <laughs> not at all disputing that but time, time to correct him <laughs> but no i just wanted to point out that um you know the measures that the town could adopt now could also still be addressed by the comp plan if if uh, new ideas or new ways, it still could be addressed, but this solution would provide relief to similarly situated people until if and when the comp plan is, is completed. Uh, the second thing is, is just as a way of observant, I think the pressures on the lake are, are increasing. And one of the things is unintended consequences by not doing anything that for that encourages people to sell these small lots yep. for them to knock down yep. one, two or three of them and then yep. build you know, the, uh, what we're seeing around the lake. So if you want to, um, you know, there's another side to that by not addressing this, you may 
I encourage people with long-term usage that can't develop their property to sell. And now you have McMansions or otherwise built on the lake that impose a whole nother uh, uh, problem. So there are both sides to this by not granting some form of uh, consistency and relief to development. And what are we talking about is not having um, two uh, front setbacks. Um, you could have a provision, for example, that would say that in those R4 and R6 districts, the uh, um, lot owner can define one of them to be the front and therefore you have a rear and two sides. So there, there would be ways that I think that would, uh, on the other side of this equation, allow for some development, but not encourage the knocking down and rebuilding of, of you know, uh, more. I'm not saying one way is better than the other. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that in many lake areas throughout New York, and definitely now in Malta, we are seeing mm -hmm. pressure. Mm -hmm. Fine, if I can't do what I want, I'm going to sell it. And now we're going to have a million dollar property. Uh, which is going to be a lot bigger and a lot more um, impactful on those areas. Mm -hmm. Just something to consider we're for the board. Auxiliary structures, right? That's what was at issue here. They weren't looking to grow the footprint of their main structure. In, is that in, correct? in this particular case, yeah. that was my impression, also, but, John. But if we change it, this change the setbacks, then then somebody else can come along, and they're subject right. to the same. In his situation, right. though, doesn't matter if it's a shed or a house, right? But in his situation, the guy that's on the side of him put his structure up before 2005, is it? Mm -hmm. So he's mm -hmm. not under the same setback as the requirement across from him. So that's what we got to fix. How about if I suggest maybe Steve work on this a little bit with Jamie and maybe Darren and see if you can come up with something that we can. Seems he also more reached out to, I mean, John, he reached out to me, reached out to Cynthia. This is an ongoing situation. And it was my understanding, it was a temporary um, shelter. He wanted to add on that side and was denied that. So there was a temporary, there was a shelter. He wanted to add on to it. He added on to it, he got cited for doing it without a building permit. Right. And then we got into the situation that we're in. He asked for three and a half years, good thing. He got two of the three because they thought that he could slide that building over <clears throat> and conform with that setback. And that's how it was left. He got two grants. One was for greater than 100 square feet because of the way that he built something, but the shed, et cetera, was greater than 100 square feet. You have right, to yeah. Grant. And you can't I heard that. So he got those two, but the one that he lacked was this setback. <clears throat> so he got two out of the three variances and has come back for special legislation to fix the third. If if that uh, okay, this. He's not come back. No. He's identified. He had for. I, I'm the one that advanced it, and I'm advancing it on the merits of this issue alone. I, I don't care if he got a hundred other variances or what happened. I'm looking at this as whether this is a good practice, a good policy, a fair practice, a fair policy, and I don't think it is. I don't think it's fair either. And if I could just advise the board that we don't want it, we're not looking to rezone as parcel. We would be doing it based right. upon the zoning areas. Um, and we, I don't think it's appropriate to consider those variances or anything with respect to that lot. It's just whether or not. The situation that exists down there needs to be fixed in fairness to the principal but not looking at the that individual. So the setback, um, if if this was not a, a street, the setback would be what? And 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 it is a street, and so the setback is what? So 12 to 40. Okay. So the problem is that if if this were ever turned into a street, then we'd have a structure 12 feet away from that border. 
which would be the same if that street if that street were a residence it would be a 12 foot setback you know if that had just been a joining piece of property but now it's 40 because it's a paver street why why would we restrict this to corner lots by the way i mean and what, what's the setback for a rear Two and a side, two fronts and two sides, actually. So, um, but let, let's say you had, you know, a, a house in the middle of a block with houses on both sides. Uh, and I don't know if this exists, but it might actually over there. Uh, and then <clears throat> the rear is another paper street. Um, what's, the, what, what's the setback? What's the setback on a rear if, if, if the person in back is just a house? Okay, what would be the setback if the, the thing in back of you was not a pay, was a street? It'd be, <laughs> it'd be a front setback, which, which would be what? Two, having two streets, one in the front, one in the back. Yeah, does that exist? I mean, it certainly can. One primary road, basically. And then the other one, have we done that? I have to ask a question because we have some that have three streets. We have lots down right. there that have that's our question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if we were if we were gonna do this, why would we restrict it to corner lots? Yeah, it's 40, every front yard is 40 for anything that faces the street, whether it's a corner or a straight or rear. Right. Yeah. And then the rear, right. If it was the rear, it would have to be 40. Okay. That's why we got so many variances. There are in, in this subdivision, Karen, so you you see you know here on the plat that was filed. There there are there aren't any where the paper street is on both sides. No. Okay. Um. Well, I mean, I I'm interested in exploring the idea. Um. Uh. Yeah, I think we we definitely need a little more uh, discussion of it, and you know, Steve and I will talk about it with Jamie and. Uh, you know, we'll explore it out and, you know, come up with some, you know, response to the board next time, if we can, by next week. Not sure. You know, I assume that you've done it thoroughly and correctly. You know, it's, it's not uh, by you know, next Monday. I'm certainly not going uh, to uh, stamp my feet. Okay. So you've looked at thoughtfully on the merits. Okay. Any other discussion of this item? Okay, we'll definitely look into it. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the Hearn Road update, and we provided the uh, board with the uh, uh, today's letter from Shazen just on the subject that had come up regarding the um, uh, regarding the opposition to uh, regarding the the petition that changed the nature of the vote, or that would have changed the nature of the vote. I think the board has that uh, in its possession. I went back. And of the original rezoning, slip zoning. And the, uh, the blue line, I'm not sure who drew it, but um, there there is no lease and bounds uh, description of that line. And when I looked at the materials today, Engineers slash surveyors have come up with a meets and bounds. I don't know whether that is you know, this thing that we adopted in April because it doesn't have meets and bounds. I don't know what the scale of the map is. I don't know if the meets and bounds from the surveyor. Is exactly the same as the line that's shown on the April 5 enactment. I don't know if the line that was drawn back in April, the map that was adopted in April, I don't know if that's a scale map. I just don't, I don't know how we arrive at a meets and bounds line months after the fact. Make a calculation on how board didn't adopt the meets and bounds line when it did the split zone. This is this measurement 
1,000 from meeting the 28 percent, 20 percent threshold. Calculating on the basis of the line that was adopted that is not a meets and bounds line. The interpretation of the, of the surveyor, uh, one way or the other, of an imprecise line could, could be making or breaking the 48 one thousandths of an acre that we make decisions about. Okay, well, we had the board's resolution, uh, you know, the, the two companies that looked into it, Shazen and, and their company that with the initial one, you know, uh, took that and performed their engineering analysis and both came up with a number that's less than 20%. So. I understand, but th what they started with, I don't know if the math sketch plan that they used was a scaled sketch plan, and it certainly doesn't have what, what we adopted. I don't know if that was scaled. And I, it certainly is in the meets and bounds line. And to do their work, they had to come up with a meets and bounds line. Well, I, I think they I think they performed their work in accordance with engineering, sound engineering principles. So, I mean, I think we have now two opinions that it was less than 20%. So can I ask them? Did they, what did they, they had to locate, they located a meets and bounds line. They came up with a meets and bounds line. How did they do it? John, people are saying they can't hear you out in Zoom. Well, what the town board adopted back on April 5th was a map that had a blue line on it, which I have right here which is not a meets and bounds line. Somebody drew a line, I'm not sure who that somebody was, on some kind of a plan. I don't know if that plan was scaled when the line was drawn on it. I don't know if what was given to the engineer was appropriately scaled um, so that there would be no distortion of the measurements of the line. I don't know any of that. Um, and to come up with a meets and bounds line, which they had to do to make the calculation, it, it needs to be exactly precise because exact precision makes or breaks this decision because it's 48, 48 one thousand of an acre short. And so, John, what you're saying is that map we were provided does not have the coordinates on it the map that was adopted with the local law yep. the rezone has a blue line that somebody drew on there. it does not have meets and bounds description of the line okay. meets and bounds you're referring to coordinates for the surveyor the, well. the drawing map does not have a meets and bounds description of the line that would give you calls as the distances and angles. Okay. And, and by the time it reaches the, the, the surveyor, I don't know what they're working on, but I don't know if this plan was a pro properly scaled plan. You're I, saying it's arbitrary then? I, I don't know. Because I, I know that I know one thing for sure our dividing line isn't a meets and bounds line, which it probably shouldn't. Um, because that's our job to make sure that our zoning district boundaries are exactly precise. And, and I don't know if the, if the plan that was laid on when it was drawn on there was a scaled plan or what was given to the engineer or the, the surveyor was appropriately scaled because inches count in this calculation. And um, I don't mind more frequently these days, but I like to use. So could Chazen clarify the, that question? Yes, and I'll see if they can. I asked someone, so 
Right. I saw that. Yeah. So I can ask someone to make sure that they attend next week and you can clarify that. All I can say is that the map that was provided to them, because there's so many parties involved in this whole entire situation, this line of that line, the, the line that could get us, you know, a, a different space from our lawsuit and whatever, you know, it's kind of hard for us to keep track too. The map we were given was from the EDP which is the property owners, surveyor, and engineer. And they drew a line and provided it to the town of Alton. That's what was adopted? That's what That's they the wanted. That's the only map we had when you, when it was adopted on the, the blue street. line map. The blue line map. Right. Because we had the green line, which was the horizontal. And that's the only right. way I can remember it. Because I green line was the di green diagonal. Line. First, the, you know, and they had there was three versions of the line because there was right. the diagonal, and then there was the blue line that Darren drew once, and then there was a line that EDP made to be a straight line that was a little bit south to give them a little bit more land to chop the wood in. Again, again, I, right. a little bit. I, I'm happy to, to for, I'll take my lumps if I lose in a fair match. All right. Well, I mean, we'll take you raise the legal question. We'll take input from you know uh, our, our lawyers on it. I mean, the the board decided the issue by a three to two vote. I mean, it was a self actuating resolution. Uh, I'm not so sure it requires any any more than you know a legal opinion on whether it's actuated or not. But you know, we can certainly consider your comments. Well, if that's the case, why do we just spend however many hundreds of thousands of dollars for chasing? Hundreds of thousands of dollars? What? Hundreds of four thousand. Forgive my speech at that end. Hey. Uh, you know, to evaluate. Yeah. I, I believe because that was it was sub request, it was John. subject it was subject to the to the engineer's, you know analysis of it. And and we've gotten the engineer's analysis of it. I'm just speaking my mind and you know uh, right. I mean, the, the issue that we, that the board um sought to, to have Chazen clear up was the sufficiency of the petition and whether or not that 20% was met. The, the actual petition didn't provide any information as to how they derived the 20%. The um, owner of the land opposed the petition by filing a map created by EDP. That map was objected to because it was drawn by the owner of the land saying, well, we can't trust their measurement. Not that we don't think they're a good company, but they, you know, they may have been asked to draw a line. So what we, um, what the board adopted was a resolution that said, um, verify that the calculation performed uh, by EDP is correct. My understanding from conversations with Chazen is that they didn't just accept it the EDP map that they went and replotted it and re-verified it to increase and give the board uh, greater satisfaction or greater understanding that yes, in fact, the 20% wasn't met. It so, doesn't go to the arbitrariness of the line in in that in any sense. It's just whether the 20% um, threshold was met. And I'm so, only stating this for clarity to the board. So to be clear, Steve, our, our land use attorneys said the 20% was not met based on their analysis. Chazen said the 20% was not met based on their analysis, correct? Well, the land, the attorney, the town attorney, me and Leah had discussions about it. Based upon the petition that was filed, there was no determination that could be made. EDP filed a map. EDP said it wasn't sufficient. Chazen has then Confirmed. Replotted and confirmed and provided it. We've reviewed their table and calculations, um, and based upon that information and the drawing of the map, agree with the map. I'm not capable of saying whether the line is in the right place or wrong place, right. but Chazen uh, has but, made those determinations. Okay. And then, do we have any indicate? I mean, 
this is the end of it. Do we have any indication that the, the petitioners will be filing litigation or is this the end of it? I have no indication there is present litigation that's ongoing. Um, but as opposed to any other litigation, I have no information about okay. that. Um, and as for the end of it, um, what this exercise was, was an exercise to for the board to do its due diligence in um, verifying the sufficiency of the position before them and not just accepting it on um, on face value and then not just accepting EDP's version. Right. Um, and the uh, litigation council and myself felt certainly, and there is case law to suggest that the engineers um, would be the sufficient party to advise the board that in their view, um, uh, that it, it does not meet the 20%. And there's nothing in that that I see that would contradict it. Okay. Um, so that's all I could add for the board. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. Um, we'll have a further discussion with the council on it. I mean, I, I think it's a, it, it's a completed issue um, based on the town board's resolution of August 5th and the input from Shazen. I, I kind of agree. I'm, I'm willing to accept, you know, it's too independent general survey company and our own engineers that that granted it's just very very just short of the 20 percent but they both verified that it was less than 20 percent and i don't hey, Steve, see any reason to dispute that but i have a question how many maps were submitted in full by the time chasen got theirs another words i'm saying did the maps change before and afterwards at, at all the, the exact copy um the I, I, if you're asking did chasen just accept edp's map no they plotted it themselves and provided their own map which um to my understanding, verifies the same line. Uh, the calculation is slightly different because um, they included some additional lands um, as adjacent lands than EDP did, but the conclusion by Chazen and EDP was the same, that it didn't meet the 20% threshold. So there was an EDP map, and then yeah. um, Chazen was not comfortable in just accepting their work, they needed to verify that map and replot it themselves. Gotcha. And in doing that, that's where that legal description meets and bounds that John uh, referenced was created by Chase. The, the one, and this will be the last thing I say. The one thing that I know as a matter of law is that it is our job as a legislative body to draw clearly distinct and uh, readily identifiable districts or, or, or boundaries of our zoning districts so that landowners have uh, ready ability to determine whether there are properties in or out of a particular zoning district. That, that map that we adopted should have had a meets and bounds description on it so that it would be abundantly clear exactly where the line was because there are zigs and there, there are jogs in it um, and uh, it should have been done with meets and bounds. And if it were, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Okay, but I didn't, I didn't hear any member of the town board suggest Correct. at the time that it had to be done with meets and bounds. This is what we have. I think we have a decision on it. So I think uh, this issue is uh, completed. Um, next item on the agenda is the Multiville Water Assistance Grants. I don't know if we have any yet, Kevin. All right. Uh, budget transfers. Can I ask about that? How long are we leaving that program open? Is it just indefinite or? Uh, I would say it's indefinite uh, because that's the way the PDD language was okay. prepared. Yep. Okay, because we. Okay. I don't think it's that old. Uh, I, you know, you got to remember that some some people's wells are fine. All right. The next day they'll go back. 
Right. Yeah. So to have this program open for a number of years, it's not, you know, I don't, I don't yeah. find it Yeah, no, I mean, I knew we weren't anywhere close to closing. I just wondered if there was. How much money so, is left, Kevin, at, at this point? How much is committed? Uh, not much has been committed. I, I'm thinking around $170,000 that's left. I thought it was about that. Engineering costs that we incurred to get into the formation, uh, intensive formation of the finger, and then the dollar amount of expended for after date. Thank you. Okay, budget transfers. We may have some of them next week, right, Kevin? Yes, there will be budget transfers for both the uh, retroactive uh, pay adjustments and also chip funding. Uh, Fair enough. Um, any other business? Yes, please. John. Have there been any further discussions or any additional information about the federal? Um, funds that have been, we heard uh, our CPA um, talk about what was uh, allocated to Coho's, which uh, reminded me that the uh, town of Malta has been allocated roughly 1.7 or $1.8 million. Do we have any other information on it? And has there been any further thought or discussion about what we might do with those funds? The US, uh, US Treasury Department has not issued any final regulations about the use of that money yet. They check their website periodically. Treasury today was less aware the last thing that they posted was to you know, make sure any local government must have a guns number. That guns number will be used by the state. And I think our money is going for the feds, the state, and the state does. First disbursements will be forthcoming in the next month or so. They haven't issued final regulations. Uh, they have indicated that it's a loss of revenue. Uh, not sure what that means entirely until they accept those regulations. But anyway, loss of revenue. Yes, the bond sales tax revenue, overall total revenue for the town of last year were up. I can't tell you until I get the regulations. They've uh, also indicated uh, for infrastructure improvements. Those were. Tentatively, they said in those out there is water, sewer, and broadway. Okay, and there's sort of, you know, so those are, that's what I have thus far. We'll see the final uh, exactly what we can and cannot use it for. I can tell you one thing that we didn't fund our equipment. Okay, that was a, a way of reducing our expenses. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Any other business? Will we adjourn? No, well, wait, wait. Uh, any any other time. comments from anybody in the town? Any hands up? Yeah. Helen, how are you doing? You're on mute probably, Helen. Okay, can you hear me? We can yep. hear you. Okay, I guess my I'm still on the ambulance district. I just wanted to say that I still don't understand um, what the purpose of creation of the ambulance district is, other than moving money from the town to create new taxes for town residents and businesses. We seem to be just be playing a shell game, moving it from one spot to the other. Uh, and just because other towns have it, it doesn't seem to be uh, justifiable reason for us to make this change, especially right now with the pandemic, because these effects are going to go on. They're not going to end at the end of this year. They're going to go on for next year and in the future. Just look at the um, uh, increased cost for um, gas, for lumber, for food. Um, it just seems that um, we're creating a town tax and just, just calling it an ambulance tax. Um, Finally, if we go to, if you know, if this is the way you want to go, uh, referendum, I agree, is the best way, but I think residents need to know the reason behind the change. 
so then they can make an informed decision uh, when they vote. That's it. Thanks, Helen. Of, uh, of course, a town tax can be used for a variety of, of reasons. An ambulance district can be used for only one. Um, so it's certainly not a town tax by another name. But uh, but I appreciate your comments. It's 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 a fair point, and you know I think it's one reason why you know the board is so interested in making sure that we get the public's decision on this and not just the town boards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we have a. Uh, um, let me know if there's anyone else out there, Jamie, but um, we have uh, a couple of issues on, you know, a um, uh, cost of real estate um, and a couple of uh, personnel issues that I think would be appropriate for an executive session. So if there's a motion to go into a brief executive session. Darren, I'm happy to make the motion on the personnel issues. Um, I think we need to more, you know, closely follow the statute and say, is it, is it the um, employment history of particular individuals, um, or, or um, because you, you know, those of us that have been to these foil and open meetings uh, seminars, that one of the things they tell you is personnel issues is not um, legitimate for executive session. It's it's used as shorthand. You, you know, you I think we need yeah. to more clearly fit. Sure, in. it's it's certainly not a personnel per policy. It it pertains to one particular individual. A particular a individual's fact. employment history. Oh, yep. Yeah, you could call it employment, right, Steve? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, prospective yeah. employment's legitimate yeah. as well. So I, I would make a motion. We go into executive session to discuss the possible acquisition of real estate, the public disclosure of which could affect the value thereof and the employment history of a particular individual in regards to um, possible employment, promotion, demotion, or termination. Respectfully request a second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And I just uh, make a, a, you know, a statement to the uh, public out there watching in Zoom when we reconvene from the executive session. Um, you know, there are no further items on the agenda, so you, you don't have to worry about missing anything. I'm, I'm quite confident that, you know, when we reconvene, it'll simply be to adjourn the meeting.